Cool. Um, so we don't have a lot of time, um, but I think it should be doable to get to some kind of web server in, in 30 minutes. Um, so just to, to be sure everyone knows what the session is about, um, maybe in the past you use, you, you've used a service like this. Uh, this is basically called Primate 3. Uh, it's a tool for calculating good primers, um, which you might use in, in PCR or some other uh, biological method. Um, but actually, right, right here is, is sort of presented in the form of a web server. And by that, we, we mean a, a website you can go to and you can basically type in your data and it will do some calculations on your data. Uh, web servers are extremely good for reusability, uh, um, right? If, if you didn't have a, a web server, basically the people wanting to use your, your code would have to download it to the local machine and, and get that to run. Um, and you know, if you had ever tried to install any, any library in, in bioinformatics, you, you, you probably know that that could be quite painful, right? Typically, you don't have the right dependencies, the right operating system, you know, lots of things go wrong when you try to use other people's code. Uh, and especially if you're not a developer, right? It might be you're just a wet, wet lab biologist. Uh, it can, you know, sometimes be, be outright impossible to, to use any of these mathematics tools. And obviously, that's a bit of a shame because we really do have a lot of, of, of cool technology uh, within bioinformatics. Um, Right, so why is it quite hard to build a web server in, in a good way? Uh, um, right, typically you would need to host this web server somewhere. Uh, uh, this can be quite expensive. Uh, uh, um, if, if it's quite computer intensive, what are you doing? Um, it can also take quite a while to set up, a, up in the right way, right? Building a website, making the, the layout look nice, you know, getting a, a HTTPS certificate. There's lots of things that just takes a really long time to set up. Um, and I think that basically causes a lot of people to just dump their code on GitHub and never actually have other people use it. And I think that's, that's a bit of a shame. Uh, there's another problem with web servers though. Uh, right, so at the end of the day, what, what we're trying to do here is basically that uh, uh, some person, the end user has some data, like this could be data coming out, out of the web lab. Uh, and then we have the algorithm, right? So the code that, that you probably wrote, uh, 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 for example, during, during this hackathon. Um, and, the typical approach would basically be that we, we, we install a, a server in the cloud or you know, in some server room. Uh, uh, we install the algorithm on that server and then the user has to send that data to, the, to that web server. Now, uh, you know, as I said, there's quite a few problems for this. But, but actually a quite major one is that uh, uh, now the end user has to reel the data to have a hosting server, right? So if, if you're working on, on quite secret data, let's say patient data, is actually a big problem. And, you know, at least in, in the EU, because of GDPR, you, you can't even do this, uh, uh, right? So then we're back to having to, uh, 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 trying to get the code to work ourselves, uh, uh, which is not a great solution. Uh, another approach is basically, what if we send the algorithm to where the data lives, right? So what if we could run the algorithm on the end user's computer? Um, and specifically, we want to do this in a, in a good way, right? So we don't want the user to have to install their own compiler, so whatnot. Um, it turns out that uh, quite recently a new technology has popped up uh, called WebAssembly. Um, it's basically a new in instruction set for the web. This is kind of the, the name uh, or description it goes under. Uh, it has actually been sort of generally supported in all browsers for, for two years at this point. Um, which means, you know, if you can get your thing to run in WebAssembly, it'll basically run. Uh, on all browsers, uh, to be extremely portable. It even, even runs on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and, and the dream here is, is, of course, if we could just you know take our tool and make it work in WebAssembly, immediately it will work across all platforms. So there will never be any, any compatibility issues. Uh, and or, very importantly, it will run in exactly the same way as on your computer. Right? So then you also get reproducibility, which is, again, very important in science. Um, it's also pretty fast, right? Typically, when you run things in, in, a, in a web page, it get a, get a lot slower. JavaScript is, is really not great uh, in terms of speed. Uh, but WebAssembly is actually really fast. Um, so to show you an example, um, some of you might know SamTools. So SamTools is basically a, uh, a, a toolkit for uh, uh, sequence analysis. Um, specifically, it's typically used for in next generation sequencing when you want to map your reads to some, uh, some reference genome. Um, it's a quite large C++ library. Uh, if you have ever tried installing it, it's very painful. There's a lot of dependencies you need to get right to actually get it to work uh, locally. Um, so we thought it could be fun to try to compile it uh, uh, to WebAssembly. 
so we did that, and we basically put it on a website. Um, so this is a screenshot of, of Sam Schultz actually running inside Google Chrome. I, I, this can be a bit confusing at this point, so I just want to make it absolutely clear that when this code executes, it executes on the uh, end use computer, right? So, so it's not sent to the cloud or anything like that. It just runs inside the web browser, but not on the internet, right? So any, any data you submit to this app or ran would not have been sent anywhere. Um, and because the compute happens on, on the client side, uh, whoever is, is uh, hosting the, the model don't actually have any expense with regards to compute cost. And also, therefore, do not need to post any limitations. Right? Quite, quite typically in, in web servers, you will see that you can maximum you know, submit 10 sequences at a time or something like that. You don't have this problem when you're running things uh, on the client side. Um, and specifically for, for samples here, so to test it out, uh, I tried a relatively large file, so uh, almost half a gigabyte uh, um, BAM file, and I ran the uh, command sample stats. Um, when I ran it sort of on my, my, my MacBook locally, it took six seconds, and it took around 10 seconds when I ran it uh, in WebAssembly. So, you know, a bit of a performance penalty, but, but really not a lot. Um, given that it's so much easier to use now, since it's in a browser, it's, it's probably actually worth it. Um, but it's not all great, at, at least yet. Uh, um, so getting your, 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 your code or your algorithm to work in WebAssembly can actually be a bit uh, tricky. Um, the, the tool chain is, is relatively uh, young, if you could say that. Uh, uh, so for, for quite a few you know, standard libraries, they still don't work. Uh, there's still no multi-threading. Uh, I think you can set a flag in Chrome, but you know, it's still very beta. Um, but generally, it's a bit tricky to get to WebAssembly. Again, once you get to WebAssembly, all is good. You know, everything executes exactly as expected. Uh, uh, but it can be a bit tricky to get there. Um, and that's basically what I work on. Um, so the, the idea behind uh, BioLab is basically that if we can write some code that can take in your uh, um, algorithm or, or your, your source code and do the mapping to WebAssembly and make that really easily, Right, then we're going to make it a lot easier for, for the end user to use a much wider range of tools in bioinformatics. Um, so to show how this could kind of work, um, I've set up this workshop. Um, so if you, you want to, to follow along, basically, you can go to this link. It's just linkedabiolib.com slash workshop. Uh, it should be pretty quick to go through. I know it says 25 minutes here, but I think it's probably more like, like five minutes. Um, and uh, in, in this particular, uh, uh, example, uh, you'll basically be creating a, a small piece of Python code that can run through some, uh, I think it's some gene expressions, and basically map that uh, in, in a plot. Um, so I'll just do that myself. Uh, if you go to the browser here, I said you could just go to uh, link.biolib.com slash workshop. Um, again, if something is, is not big enough, let me know and I can try to zoom in. Um, so basically, you get to this page where everything I'll be saying now is described. Basically, so you can go through it in, in, uh, at your own pace. Um, so to create a, a, an application in WebAssembly, I'm just going to go to the Create button up here. Um, again, all, all in an ideal world, all, all you would have to focus about is basically just pasting in your source code. Um, so I'll actually just go back and, and grab the source code of this, this, uh, this application. So what it does is basically it takes in some input data, uh, it then parses it, and it then using matplotlib, which is a common uh, uh, Python framework for drawing graphs, will basically draw a graph that looks a bit like this. Um, so let's try that out. I'm going to go to create here, and then I'm just going to create a file. Uh, I'll paste in the source code. Um, again, the hope is that this is exactly the same source code you write locally, so you wouldn't need to make any changes. Um, We'll save that, and you know it automatically recognizes that this was Python. But again, if I had some other language, I could basically select that. Um, I'm going to save that now. When designing a web server, you obviously need to specify what input you you expect from your user, right? So it might be somewhere web servers just require you to paste in a sequence or into some bio information about a patient or whatever it might be. Or it might be that you require some files as an input. Um, so in this particular case, I'm going to require uh, uh, some standard input, which is going to be a file. I'm going to require one additional input, uh, which should be basically uh, uh, a significance threshold. Um, so we, uh, I can basically write a description, and actually this is exactly log 
P in my case. So the negative logarithm of, of a P value. Um, I then specifically specified the input key. Uh, so this is the uh, input key my Python code expects. Uh, it uses arc pass to basically pick this out. And I can specify some default values. Let's go for 2.5. Um, that's basically it. I can just quickly give it a name here. So let's say my hackathon well, my it's app point to three. Um, I can write some description. This is a test. Uh, and then basically all I have to do is, is write save. And what I have now is basically a link. So this is a basically a live web server I can set to my colleagues or my peers or whoever it might be. If they if they land on, hey, on hackathon the, app uh, think someone needs to is showing how to set up an application. In uh, um, Violet, I think so. Yeah. Oh, ah, sorry. Actually, it be useful. sorry, could you mute here? Who talking? Um, okay, going back to uh, to to the application. Uh, so right now, basically, I have a, have a, a link I could send to anyone. So this acts exactly like a web server. If I run it, basically, I'll now be prompted with the input I just specified. So in, in this particular case, I'm prompted with with input data. Um, so I'll just select uh, this file. They did locally actually have a file. Um, uh, this is some uh, gene expression data, as I said. I'll pick the CSV file. Um, again, this, this file is not actually uploaded anywhere. It's just in, in, in Google Chrome now inside the browser's memory. Uh, I'll get prompted with some significance threshold. You know, I could change that or I could just use the default value. I now press uh, start computation. So what this will do is basically, uh, I wrote some Python code here. And uh, Python is, is not a compiled language, it's an interpreted language. So actually what will happen is that my browser is not gonna download a compiled version of the Python interpreter compiled to WebAssembly. Um, whenever that's done, it's gonna basically go through the code and look at all the dependencies, right? So as I said, I used matplotlib to draw graphs. It will then download versions of those dependencies compiled to WebAssembly. Uh, um, it will then initialize it all uh, again, this could take a bit of time because, you know, Metal Clip has quite a lot of dependencies. And then finally, it will run the application. Um, the file here is, is a few megabytes, I think uh, 10, so, so not a lot, uh, uh, um, but it will still take some time to process this data. Again, I, I think you're probably looking at a 40% speed penalty. Um, so now the, the computation uh, completed, and I, as the end user, basically get the, uh, the graph back uh, uh, of my data. And you can see for this particular case, uh, uh, I specified a, a significance threshold of 2.5. That is the negative logarithm of the p-value. And I can see that I found four significant genes here. Um, and the, they act, the app actually prints them out. Um, so all the, the app does, if you go back and, and look at the Python code, it's just printing out in, in Markdown. Um, so basically, you can, you can, it's very customizable, uh, the report you get out here. Um, the user can now print this or, or download it. Just download the button up here that basically will give you all the files back as a zip file. Um, so they can basically take this result and include it in their paper or do whatever uh, they like with it. Um, so I hope so this makes sense. Uh, the idea is basically to allow you to create a, a web server really quickly. Um, again, again, you know, we basically want to set it up so it's so easy for you that you can just focus on your code and all this thing about configuring servers and things like that. It's not something you should have to bother with. Um, is there any questions at this point? Uh, I would like to know what kind of uh, file format will the result be in? It's a great question. Um, so uh, right now, uh, every single application that runs actually gets its own file system. Uh, so it's a bit like, uh, I guess there's, there's some similarity with Docker but basically you can get a, a virtual file system. Um, so it's actually up to you what you return. So I guess as an example, um, I can try to, let's try to edit the app here. Um, and uh, I'll just, as an example, try to write a new file. Um, so just at the end of my, uh, my Python script here, I'm gonna write a file. Uh, if I can remember how you do that in Python, one second. Uh, but basically the code should execute exactly the same way as it would on, on, on your browser. So here's a very quick uh, write file in Python. So this will basically open a file uh, I call uh, demo file2.txt. It'll write something and it will close it. 
right? But this is exactly, you know, Python as it normally would. So if we do that uh, and save it, and this probably will not work because it's a demo, but uh, fingers crossed. Um, so basically, if I ran this Python script locally, you know, it will write a demo file that seeks the txt in, in in the folder I was currently in. Now I would basically expect it to uh, to to write the same thing to the virtual file system. Uh, and whenever it is done com computing, uh, uh, it will basically return the virtual file system inside that zip file. So we should now see uh, the demo file two txt actually be included in the result we get back. So in essence, you can basically return as many files as you want in in any particular file format. Uh, it's really up to you how you want to design it. Um, again, the output the user shown is just uh, Markdown. Um, but yeah, whatever goes in, in the end result is, is basically up to you. Um, if that makes sense. I'll just try to see if that this works. So I'm going to download results up here and I get a zip file back. Uh, let's see. Did it come up here down here? Great. So this is basically the uh, file on zip. So if we go into files, we can now see that the demo file that seeks to the txt is actually here and it has the right content. Right. So basically your apps can return whatever uh, files they want, but that's not really any limits. Cool. Um, one last thing I want to show before we run out of time is basically um, so this was a Python app. Um, so specifically in, in my challenge in, in Hackathon, uh, it's about uh, protein prediction, it's basically taking a, an amino acid sequence and predicting a structure from it. Um, so say for fun, we basically wanted to add this application to, to BioLib uh, uh, to basically make it run uh, uh, in WebAssembly. Now, most machine learning methods uh, uh, or frameworks will actually be able to export your model. Um, and there's a few different formats you could do this in. So let me just pick up uh, Python here. Um, so a, a model in, uh, in Open Protein was the framework we're using in the challenge. Uh, it basically specifies some neural network that can predict protein structures from the raw amino acid sequence. Um, it turns out these models can actually be exported. Um, and Specifically in machine learning, there's a file format called ONNX, which stands for Interchangeable Neural Networks, or something like that. Um, uh, it's basically a serialization of, of your, your neural network. Uh, and luckily, uh, PyTorch can export directly to that. Um, so specifically how that would look, I just try to pick up a file here. We have a file called export ONNX. It basically just uh, takes in your, your PyTorch model from disk, I hope this is not too small. Uh, you then specify an example input, so just sort of an, an amino acid sequence. Um, you then uh, run this function called uh, ONX for model, and that basically just gives you back an ONX file. Um, so if I try to run this, basically, um, it will just it will look in, in, into my exported models and take, find the last one, and then basically export that to ONX. So if you can see, again, it's might be too small, but uh, basically, what's dumping out here is, is the full uh, serialization of my neural network. So all the, the instructions uh, in my neural network performs. Uh, and actually, I can uh, visualize these if I wanted to see uh, exactly how the neural network was looking. Uh, see here, uh, I'm using a, a library called the Neutron for doing this, but you know, there's probably other ones. Um, so this is basically a good visualization to see exactly. Uh, what your neural network does. Um, see if this starts. Right, so here it is. So you basically see this is my uh, very small example neural network that breaks protein structures. So basically, it takes in my input up here, and then it does a number of operations on that. And then at the very end, it gets uh, down to my prediction of the structure. Uh, and you can see this is the output size of this is 200 times 3, which is basically the uh, three three dimensional coordinates in Cartesian space. Anyway, going back to the web server part, the question is now how, how do you get this on, on its work in, in the web browser? Um, I cheated a bit and prepared a model from home. Um, basically, you can have uh, some very similar code um, in a, a WebAssembly app. Um, so I wrote this very small WebAssembly app that, that basically uh, 
takes in uh, some, some input data, so a sequence, uh, runs through it. It basically uh, transforms it into a, a JSON format that ONX can execute. Um, I then uh, used uh, the ONX command. Uh, so this is using subprocess like you, you would locally. It uh, puts in the, the sequence and basically gets the result back. Uh, you can see a bit how the app looks, looks like if I just go back here. Um, you can kind of see I have two tasks. I have my Python code, which is you know what you saw just before. Uh, and I have my uh, uh, ONX task, which is done here, which is basically just the, uh, the ONX app I just exported. I can just uh, select it here so you can actually see that it works. Um, see, open protein uh, test here. So I basically just pick my ONX file and I click save. So if this works, basically, I should now be able to run my application. And so what the, this does is basically just first process is the, the predefined amino acid sequence. Uh, uh, it, it just basically encodes it. Uh, and then it uh, uh, changes it to JSON such that ONX can actually read it. Um, it will then uh, uh, call the ONX app and get the result back. And I haven't actually made this pretty, so now right now it just dumps it. Basically, this is the output it coordinates of, of the final protein. I could then uh, visualize if, if I wanted to do that. Cool. Um, I think that was it. Is there any questions? Um, so, so this is basically how we should ideally present the results from this hackathon or... Um, it's entirely up to you. Uh, again, it could be really awesome if, if other people can use your application. Um, but, you know, it's always most important to get good results in, in the hackathon itself. Uh, this is just really a way of, of presenting it. Um, yeah, I think it's, this, this works best if you're working on something that, you know, would work well as a, as a web server. Uh, um, but obviously, if, if your project is about getting some results or uh, uh, finding some drop targets or whatever it might be, a web server is probably not that meaningful. Um, so, so just to yeah. clarify that, yeah, you yeah, the, go on. have to present is you have to present the, the uh, presentation, which will be in PowerPoint or PDF. And if you, there will be a chance for you to share your screen. So you want to do some demo, that's that's fine. It definitely doesn't have to be presented in this way. This is just the yep is saying here's. A tool you can use, and and yeah, so no, it certainly does not have to be presented in this way. Can you run it again? Which uh, languages does it support nowadays? Uh, sure. Um, so uh, basically. Some, some languages are easier than others, right? So uh, compiled languages are generally very nice. Uh, so C and Rust just works. Uh, here's the list. Um, uh -huh. uh, for Python and R, we actually had to write our own uh, interpreters, right, because they're interpreter languages. Um, so that works okay. Uh, all of standard libraries should basically be supported. Um, for machine learning, uh, again, we support ONX. Uh, TensorFlow I actually like to save uh, its models in, in Protobuf, uh, uh, so that should work. Um, again, if there's some other language, you know, definitely very happy to, to look into how that could be compiled to WebAssembly. Um, yeah, I, I think a, a lot of people ask why don't you just use Docker for something like this. Uh, uh, I think the way, the way I see WebAssembly is basically the next generation of Docker. So I think eventually over time, most languages should support sort of native export to, to WebSymbol. Um, I missed most of the presentation, but is it possible to use uh, external libraries? It is. Uh, so it kind of depends on, on what the library is. Um, so if the library is, is already uh, compiled to WebAssembly, uh, you can basically call that directly. Uh, if it's not, you might yourself have to figure out how to compile it. Um, yeah, a again, you know, standard things like Bio, Python, or whatever should already be working. Uh, I don't know in particular what, what, what library you're looking at here, but 
I mean, quite similar to what you would have to do if you were to, to make it work inside your Docker image, you would basically here have to, to port it to the, the WebAssembly container. Okay, so that means that the server is actually not executing Python or Rust, it's actually executing WebAssembly. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is where it gets a bit confusing, right? So it's executing uh, a WebAssembly interpreter that is executing your Python. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope that's not too confusing. And, and this is not to cut, cut off the conversation, but I think what we should do is if you have questions for Jeppe, then he is in the, in the Slack channel as well. So just feel free to direct message him or throw a question maybe in the protein origami um, section where I think Jeppe will also be following along because then we should move on to Marianne. Sure, awesome. Thanks everyone. <laughs>